Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think we start with a confession. Is that uh, I'm from the dark side. <laughs> One of those people that thinks seeds are more interesting than citation. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk to you about is some work that I've been doing to try and get a little bit of a, a better insight into the brain of seeds. Because if you're a brain, <clears throat> excuse me, a marine mammal, inside the head of a marine mammal is a pretty extreme place to be for a number of reasons. First of all, like seals spend 80% of their time at sea, and 90% of that time they're holding their breath. And for anybody that's familiar with or has experienced traumatic brain injuries, you'll know how catastrophic the effects can be of just a very short time without enough blood and enough oxygen in the blood. So that's what seals do on a day-to-day -day basis. For instance, <clears throat> they can quite comfortably go from 120 beats a minute, their heart rate, and in one interbeat interval, so between heartbeats, go to four beats a minute. Plus 120 beats to four beats a minute like that. Now if that happened to you, you wouldn't know much about it, we'd be on the floor of the column 999. These guys do this all the time, so much so that like, we know that there's a conscious aspect to it, that you can command, say, to drop its heart rate from 120 beats a minute to like 60 beats a minute just by lifting your hand. There's very, very, very conscious control of this whole suite of physiological changes. But not only that, the amount of oxygen in the blood can be incredibly low. <coughs> So you're all sitting here now at about, about if you're healthy, about 99, if you're not, about 96% oxygen. These guys can comfortably, repeatedly, present to 10% oxygen in a normal dive and continue to do that dive after dive, day after day, without sort of seeming to have any, suffer any of the consequences that we would suffer. So what I'm interested in is, is, is a better understanding of what is actually happening in the brain because it's a very, very difficult thing to measure. And the sort of overarching sort of, sort of uh, backdrop to this is understand the impacts of anthropogenic disturbance on marine mammals. To say, seems have this sort of conscious system they set up. So if they know they're going to die for a long time before they die, we'll put in the sort of action a suite of changes that's appropriate for that dive duration, and then that allows them to die for as long as they intend to. But what we want to know is what happens if you then have sort of an anthropogenic stressor. You start to upset that balance. This sort of sophisticated physiological system they have, how, how can they cope with that? Particularly at the level of the brain, because it's a sort of, a, sort of a precious part of the body, it's your con control center. As you listen to me now, as you go take it when I'm saying you're watching, that's all going through your brain. And sort of freeing the work I'm doing, I want to introduce you to this, this model here, it's called the Interim Population Consequence of Disturbance Model. And this is really the framework that uh, the science community are using to sort of get a handle on what are the impacts that we have on marine mammals. So this is our stressor here. So this would be, for the rest of the talks, going to be anthropogenic noise. So exposure to a stressor, like Marielle blowing an air horn, quite a stressful anthropogenic sound. <laughs> and out of that, your behavior could change. So you hear that, and you're, you're on my cow. Or your physiology could change. Your heart rate goes through the roof. Of course, the two things. <coughs> and then these, these chronic effects is that that happens a lot of times. And you have to keep running away. Your costs go up. So the amount of energy, the calories that you're burning on a normal day-to-day -day basis start to go through, start to get higher. And suddenly if your heart rate's going up all the time and you're using more oxygen, this starts to affect your health. Basically, you're using more energy all the time. And then that might affect your vital rates because you're using more energy. If you're using more energy, you might not have enough fat to have a pup. If you don't have a pup, that starts to affect the population. And these sort of outer bands here, so if your heart rate changes, it goes too high, you have a heart attack and you die, well, that affects your vital a year of population. Or if your behavior changes, if you hear a sound, you panic, for instance, like some of the cetaceans perhaps, they beach, they die, that affects the vital rate of the population dynamics. What I'm interested in here is sort of this side, is this initial physiological change and behavioral change. Although we've got this sort of nice symmetrical graph, our ability to sort of parameterize these changes is not even. So the, our, phys our ability to measure parameterize physiological changes is very durable. Pretty good at is measuring behavioral change, particularly in seals. A couple examples of that are from two authors from SHMU using these, basically it's a glorified mobile phone that we just glue to the fur of seals and it stays on for nine months. 
So the first example of a Russell et al. is that during the, um, the piling to set up wind farms, it means that uh, during those active piling, CNC can avoid the area. So it can drop by like 80%. So CNC just don't find the area, they just get out of dollars, they get away from the sounds. And then again, another example is actually during the functioning, so the functional phase of a renewable energy is by PSD et al. So basically, seems avoid this tidal turbine, which trying to rot and everything's rotating, so it's sort of avoidance. So as I say, we're pretty good at, uh, we have an ability to parameterize these behavioral changes, but we don't have an ability to parameterize these physiological changes. And that's where my interest is, what happens to the brain, for instance, whenever you have a stressor. And then an example of why the physiology is important, and not just behavior, makes me an example of these eider ducks. So whenever eider ducks are approached on a nest, the eider ducks don't move. So if you're looking at behavior, every time people approach these eider ducks, they don't move. So you say, okay, the eider duck's fine. In fact, the heart rate's going through the roof. I have to say, I've got quite a bit of empathy for this higher at the minute. Because my heart rate at the minute is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you think my behavior is normal. But that's just an example. So, yeah, as I say, what I want to do is try and find a, a tool that will allow us to sort of parameterize these physiological changes. To sort of start to feed some real world data into this model that helps us start to get a handle on what are the effects of exposures to anthropogenic sounds, such as offshore renewables. But the other side of this that I'm interested in, because the brain is such a, an informative part of the body, is that this sort of, one of the sort of implicit assumptions here is that each time an animal hears a sound, the sound, the response is going to be the same, but that's just not the case. And I was going to show you a video, unfortunately it's not then, so I'll sort of try to describe it. And this actually happened to me a couple of nights ago. I was back visiting my mom and dad in Ireland. I was sitting reading a book. And then whenever I set the book down, I started to hear a clock tick. And nothing in that soundscape changed, but now I was hearing the clock tick. And that's because depending on what your brain is doing, you perceive things in different ways. And then when you start to hear the clock tick, you want to not take a clock at the clock. And because I changed my behavior, the physiology changes, my heart rate goes up, so I perfuse my body. So it's that kind of paradigm that I'm trying to capture. Not only how you perceive the sound, do you hear the sound, but then what are the, these behavioral changes that we already know, and what does that mean for the animal's physiology? So yeah, this is the project here. We develop a monitoring tool, to at least test the efficacy of a monitoring tool that allows direct measurement of the sound detection and the physiological responses. With a view of being able to integrate this in with the devices that we use to look at those behavioral changes. But to be able to do that in a sort of meaningful, powerful way, we have to work within the same constraints as those that basically purify phones that we put on a scene. And those either have to be wearable, they have to be small, and, and, and really important, they have to be non-invasive. And that gives us quite a limited sort of <laughs> number of options. And the technology that I've been pursuing is this thing called the infrared spectroscopy. <clears throat> and most of you have probably experienced this because if you've been in the hospital or the doctor, Put everything in your finger, that's exactly what it is. And it's an optical case technique that was developed for it was developed for to measure brain oxygenation in premature babies. But then it's also been developed as a cognitive neuroscience tool because people don't really like the idea of putting a baby in an MRI scanner. So it's an incredibly safe optical technique, but basically it's a glorified Fitbit. So all it requires is it just needs to be in contact with the skin. <coughs> very, very low power, low level light. And as I said, I just want to stress this was developed for babies. It's incredibly safe. And everything I'm going to talk about and say is I'm also doing it humans. So it's an incredibly safe technique. It just relies on light in contact with the skin, same as a Fitbit does. And because your skin, the main characteristic of your, of your tissues is you don't absorb light, you scatter light. So you put a light, your finger on a light, you can see the light through your finger, even though there's a big bone in it. It's on that light. A little fraction of light passes back out where it's detected. And that detected light tells us two things. It tells us how much of the hemoglobin that's in the blood is circulating, carrying oxygen around the body, how much that's got oxygen on it, and how much of it does not have oxygen on it. And together, they tell us two very, very important things. One is the blood volume, so how much blood is in the tissue, and how much of that blood is oxygen in it. And in humans, it's been broke up into near for has been broke up into sort of two major categories. One's like an exercise physiology, so the blood volume, the oxygenation, it tells your heart rate, it tells your breathing rate, and also how much oxygen you consume, so how hard your body's working. And then the other side of it is this cognitive neuroscience.
a science tool. Basically, it allows you to see is your brain detecting a sign, but also how you're perceiving the sign. Actually, it can tell you some of that. Give you some information about it's an emotional elicitation of the sign. So, do you like the sign? Do you find the sign stressful? Is it something that you're just used to that you barely notice? So, these are the two traits, sort of the two aims that I wanted to look at. Is can I find a device and test the device that allow me to do both of these things? So to do that, we use our short-term captive animal facility, seeing our research in it. We can bring in a couple of sales for a month or two, and then we have a, a big pool that would basically put a feeder in one end and a little breathing chamber in the other end, and see just like to swim back and forward and choose if it wants to dive at all, how long it wants to dive, how fast it wants to swim, how long it wants to stay in the feeder, and come back again, basically give them a few kilos of fish, and they dictate how long they want to dive and how long the dive durations are. So I'm going to show you a video here of sort of this first phase as an exercise physiology. So what you're going to see here, this is one of our animals, Ulf, in his breathing chamber. It's basically like an ice hole. So all the harbor seals and gray seals are both historically ice breathing seals. So they're very, very comfortable being in this little chamber. Actually, it's quite hard to get them out again. And I can just sit there and watch it. So what you're going to see, this is, this is Ulf. And that's our little instrument there in the head. And what you're going to see on the right hand side here, this is the blood volume in that part of the brain. And this is the oxygenation. In that part of the brain. So, and these are synced with what that animal is doing in real time. So, this is basically real time of what's happening inside that animal's head. So, right from the off here, long before he dives, he's starting to change blood volume. So, basically, that, it's not a facial uh, a response to facial immersion. He's starting to enact all of these changes dictating his dive duration before he dives. And as he swims around the feeder, oxygen is going down. And then, just as he gets to the feeder, oxygenation starts to go back up again. So even though he's got no access to ambient air, his blood oxygenation is going back up through the roof again. So it took me about a year to work out how we were doing that, so I can make a look at And then, since the feeder, and our oxygen, our blood is going up again, as we do if you hold your breath, and our oxygenation is starting to drop down again. And then as he heads back off again, back around, basically this low value here, just before he gets to the surface, we can also use that say how much oxygen he used, so basically how many calories he used in that dive, as well as what was happening in his brain, and how much perfusion there was, and how well be it that was in that video. So if we go back to this, now it looks like we've got a tool that picks these boxes, but also gives us a way of actually looking at how much more calories that animals have to use as well as what the physiological responses might be to the stressor. And the other side of this it was this cognitive neuroscience tool. So while we were looking at one little part of the brain, if you sort of look at other parts of the brain, you can actually start to look, you see functions like an MRI scanner. And basically how that works is if you follow this light with your eye, you see what's happened there is you use two parts of your brain. You use your visual cortex in the back of your brain, and the prefrontal, that allows you to know where that is in terms of space and time relative to you. And what happens there is those two neuronal bundles, when they start to activate, <coughs> you see your brain responds by delivering more blood to those parts that allows you to keep up with the oxygen of metabolism. And whenever you can map that, that blood, those two things, that blood volume and oxygenation, you can see which parts of the brain are being activated. And how that works, this is an example of how the infrared sort of employs that. So this is a study on humans with them different signs. So this part of the brain here, that's the part of the brain response to something ambient, like people talking. And then the other side of it, this is sorry, this is where the brain responds to something that you're not used to, it's not actually the sign of a daily client. So you see different parts of the brain that are activated telling you something about how you're perceiving the signs, but also that magnitude of how much more blood you put into the brain. So again, we wanted to test this, so we use our captive animal facility again. So we tested, we brought in five uh, right seals and instruments with them. And then we're really interested in the auditory response. But then we want to see, okay, if we need to find the auditory, we need to also look at other parts of the brain. So we also look at the visual stimulation, and then the whiskers, which are primary senses, here, that beautiful big crystal assemblage, to see if we can tell which parts of the brain are doing what. So this is one of our, one of our animals. So this is a 3D model that Andrew helped me with. 3D model, and then underlaid in that, the 3D model of the skull. And this is sort of the brain cavity here. And these blue regions, those are the primary sense, so it's the eyes, that's the eyes responding to visual stimulation. And then this um, 
red region here, that's the higher processing, so that's the sort of wise part of the brain, so that's how you perceive. So it's an extra sort of step to sort of dive into these data to see the different stimuli, how is the brain responding. So for the eyes, what we expect it to be, same as cats and dogs, up in the back of the brain, and then this whole sort of frontal region, so that higher processing. And the next one, this is whiskers. So the whiskers you see there, that sort of primary stimulus is down here, just the base of the brain, so that's the part of the brain responding to the stimulus of whiskers. And then these sort of higher red spots again, that's sort of a higher processing. And what's interesting is whenever we stimulate these whiskers, this is little front bit that go. Whenever we stimulate the ones up on top, it's the one that back goes. So it's different parts of the brain that are registering that information. And then our last one here is the auditory, so just around sort of the, yeah, the back bottom back of the brain, again where we expect to be seen as cats and dogs. But interestingly, all the processing is happening on the left hand side of the brain. It's the same as us. So if I was talking now and you played a little bit of sound over it, that all that lateralization happens all on the left side of your brain. So you're processing all that, trying to disentangle that my what what's encoded and what I'm saying out of that noise, all happening on one side. So basically now within here, the sort of prefrontal again, that's where we want to look to see how do the animal spawn signs that we associate with positive? So a feeding whistle, signs that are completely new, so these anthropogenic signs, and then something we know that the animal's not necessarily very keen on, which is the signs that they play from um, uh, fish farms, so these deterrent signs, to sort of get an idea of where in the brain those different signs are being processed. So uh, yeah, to come back to this, this was one of those, if we do this, I think we're quite happy, I don't actually. Initially, initially, anyway, we've got an efficacy test. We say this is a technology that we would like to take out and like test on free ranging animals in a very, very short term, for maybe a day or two. I'll leave you with this little guy, so just finish my point that not only are seeds more interesting, but <coughs> much more handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is our next aim is that we're going to work with some colleagues in the US and work on these little very short experiments in free ranging northern elephant seals to see can we actually look at which senses animals are using at different times, as well as mapping these physiological changes. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll be around the whole time if anybody has any questions. Thank you.